today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, this panel discussion is entitled uh, Primitive Accumulation as a Factor in uh, Fiscal Sustainability Policies. Uh, the panel will deal uh, with uh, some of the questions that have been raised uh, in the context of uh, severe debt crisis uh, in the countries of the periphery of the Eurozone and the European Union. Uh, we know that countries such as Greece, Portugal, uh, as well as Hungary and Romania have been after the eruption of uh, the global capitalist crisis, the first uh, victims of harsh uh, austerity measures and uh, structural adjustment policies that were enforced by the so-called Troika, the IMF, the ECB and uh, the European Commission. So the panel discussion will address the following question. So should the current uh, fiscal sustainability policies for uh, managing and controlling the debt uh, crisis in the peripheries of the EU and the Eurozone, that is policies that include draining public funds by means of uh, high interest rates on sovereign bonds and pro programs of uh, privatization of assets that have uh, so far been public uh, and so on, be seen as uh, practices of uh, primitive accumulation. And uh, uh, there are uh, three uh, participants here uh, with us. Uh, so from, I will introduce them from my left to my right. So the first uh, one is uh, uh, Marco uh, Kajan. Uh, he's a, a sociologist, a doctoral student of uh, sociology at the Faculty of Arts in Ljubljana. Uh, he's also a member of the Workers and uh, Punks University and the Research at the Institute of Labor Studies in Ljubljana. Uh, so in the middle uh, there is uh, Jan Toporowski. Uh, Jan Toporowski, uh, studied economics at uh, Birkbeck College, uh, London and the University of Birmingham. Uh, he worked in fund management for the Church uh, Commissioners for England as an international economist for Standard Chartered uh, Bank and the uh, Economist uh, Intelligence Unit and most recently as a, a visiting research fellow at the Bank of Finland. In 2003 he joined uh, SOAS, uh, School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, uh, uh, with a uh, Leverhulm uh, Fellowship to write an intellectual biography of uh, Kaletsky, an endeavor, and, uh, an endeavor that continues to be frustrated by his uh, duties, duties as a head of the Department uh, of Economics since 2009. And uh, we also have here uh, with us uh, Ms. Laužitko, who is an uh, assistant at the Faculty of Philosophy in Zagreb uh, and a political activist. Uh, his uh, research interests include uh, the theory of money, history of banking, uh, Marxist theory of value and uh, Marxist uh, epistemology. Uh, we'll start with uh, Marco Kajan. Uh, his uh, presentation is uh, entitled uh, From the Crisis of Public Finance to the Crisis of the Public Sector and the Welfare State. So, Marco, Thank you. Uh, obviously, uh, the title uh, uh, describes a certain sequence of events which I think can be applied to countries like Slovenia, but also some other Eurozone member states uh, in the present crisis. Uh, this uh, intervention is composed of two parts. Uh, the first part will be a short chronology of the crisis in the case of Slovenia. And then in the second part, I would like to comment on some of the trends which I think can be best uh, analyzed by the use of the term uh, of the concept of accumulation. I was focused especially on the, on the issue of debt. And now the chronology uh, would begin in 2004 uh, because uh, this is the time when the Slovenian economy began overheating. In 2007, 3% growth, which is uh, more than double what the average EU growth was and uh, much than about double what Slovenian average growth in previous periods was. Uh, this was followed with quite uh, high inflation at the time, and this is one specific feature which uh, distinguishes Slovenia from other countries uh, like Spain, Italy, and especially Portugal, uh, that were almost stagnating before the crisis. Now, what Slovenia did have in common with those countries is uh, what I would call uh, inflation in the circuit of uh, fictitious capital. So, uh, the, the prices of uh, assets both bonds uh, and the real estate uh, were rising rapidly at the time and uh, there was a large amount of credit moving into the economy. Uh, now, uh, the mechanism of, of, this, uh, of this process was quite, quite simple, of course. Uh, there were banks who were borrowing the interbank uh, market and then lending uh, to enterprises and uh, households uh, in the country. 
Uh, another Slovenian specific is that most of the credit went actually to the corporate sector and not to, to the uh, households, um, which means that uh, the whole deliver the deleveraging process was, was uh, focused uh, in that, uh, in that uh, area of the society. Uh, so uh, the companies were investing that money, uh, obviously, uh, some of it uh, to, for, to buy assets like real estate and, and bonds, some of it went uh, to, uh, um, for, uh, for this notorious uh, leverage buyout by, by management, uh, but uh, the majority actually went to finance the, uh, was used to finance the um, uh, investment in, in, in core activities. So this was the, this was the, the situation immediately before the crisis. Uh, and when the crisis, so there, there was overheating of real economy and inflation of uh, so-called fictitious capital. Now the downturn that came was relatively abrupt. Uh, the GDP dropped by 7.8% in 2009. Uh, industrial production dropped by double that figure, and you can imagine what the consequences were for the uh, employment. Um, the exporting sectors were hit the first because uh, the external demand collapsed and. Uh, but then crisis, of course, moved to and spread to, to, to the so-called domestic sectors, uh, especially financial holdings and uh, constructions. Uh, the banking sector was hit as well and simultaneously because it was no longer able to borrow money on interbank on interbank markets. Uh, and it was this that, together with uh, tightened regulations on uh, capital advocacy, uh, that uh, triggered uh, sort of a credit crunch. Uh, so a vicious circle was formed because companies were not, no longer able to roll over their debt and uh, this was of course reflected in, bank, in the balance sheets of, of the banks uh, which became filled with uh, non-performing loans. And this is pretty much uh, the, the situation right now. The, the, the economy is in, uh, in a recession and it re and will remain so in the uh, next year and uh, this share of non-performing loans is constantly growing. Uh, I think it is pretty much obvious where, why this is a problem, why this became a problem for, for public finance. Uh, the state has been calling to intervene to help the companies and especially to help the banks. What it did was that it socialized the, the private debt of the corporate sector by recapitalizing uh, the banks. Um, of course, in the time of crisis, there are also other extraordinary expenses for the state, such as um, um, unemployment reliefs, uh, welfare benefits, which also rise, whereas uh, the, the tax revenues obviously fall or at least uh, stagnate. Uh, so this meant, of course, that uh, quite large uh, budget deficits were formed, although uh, most of the years not as high as the EU average. But still enough, of course, to, uh, to, to increase the financing needs, uh, which increased the public debt from 22% from in 2008 to 54% in 2012. But you probably know that the figures for the European Union are much higher. The average debt is 83%, 85% for GDP. Uh, however, uh, although, uh, however uh, Slovenia is one of those countries where, which are facing serious liquidity problems at the moment because of high interest rates on its uh, sovereign loans and uh, treasuries. So this chronology will, will, will start here. Um, and I would like to move uh, now to this uh, second uh, part of my title, how this uh, crisis of the public finance became a crisis of uh, public sector and welfare state. When I say this, I simply mean what impact did it have uh, what impact did the austerity measures have on the people who are either working in the public sector or uh, for the people who are uh, dependent on their on the services or social transfer uh, transfers by this um, public sector? Uh, the picture is, of course, much uh, similar to the one you find in all European countries. Uh, the, the, the wages in the sectors are lower. There have been some jobs lost. Uh, public spending has been curtailed. Uh, which, had, had, which has had obvious effects on aggregate demand uh, and growth. And on the other hand, the quality of the public services has been, is being put into, questions, uh, into question at the moment and the standard of people who are who depend on, for instance, unemployment reliefs or welfare benefits has obviously fallen. Now, um, so uh, one way of uh, 
talking about human uh, optimization, optimization will obviously be to uh, to predict uh, what those uh, processes and measures will amount to. Uh, actually, this is not what I want to to to, to analyze today because um, on Sunday a U of U I think has uh, got uh, uh, quite a. Uh, uh, um, um, an interesting scenario, uh, very uh, realistic one, of what might happen when those processes would, would reach a certain point when the welfare state would be weakened to such extent uh, that the demand for its services, for the health care, for, for social care, for, for education and so on, uh, would actually be met by the supply of private firms rather than uh, uh, social or state institutions. And of course, the demand for those services would be supported by private insurance schemes of various sorts as well. Um, I think this is, I, I, as I said, I don't want, don't want to go into this because I think this is a clear case of primitive uh, accumulation. Because you have means of production which were social or state-owned uh, becoming private property and their products, their services, uh, are becoming commodities. So you have uh, dispossession and uh, commodification uh, at the same time, uh, you have a capitalist mode of production which is encroaching upon another type of production uh, which was not a production of commodities or it, or it certainly was not a production of commodities for profit. For instance, if you have a pension fund, if you have the, the, if you picture, imagine the, the pension funds uh, like, the, like the public ones, you see that the money which, with which they uh, dispose is not, uh, is not capital. Cannot be lent if there is no interest. Whereas when you have an investment fund, that is a classical type of, um, of interest bearing capital. Um, so, okay, uh, but as I said, I, I do not want to go on, on this, uh, into this because I think enough has been said already in this conference. What I do want to, to do is uh, to return to the problem of the public debt. Uh, because as you know, Marx considered the public debt and international credit system an important uh, mechanism of primitive accumulation. He says, this system transforms idle money into interest-bearing capital. And the interests are not made out of profits, but out of uh, taxes. Uh, Marx actually had two definitions, I would say, about, uh, on, on this, uh, on this uh, particular issue. On one hand, he says, OK, um, primitive accumulation, that is, um, interest bearing capital plus uh, taxing system. Uh, on the other hand, he does go a bit further and says, okay, this is not uh, enough. In order to, to be able to speak about primitive accumulation, you have to have uh, expropriations of this possession. And this dispossession happens uh, because of the pressure of these uh, taxes, primarily and debt, on uh, certain classes in the society, such as small artisans, small merchants, and peasants to become actually proletarians because they have to sell their holdings in order to be able to pay those taxes or their debt. Now, uh, those two processes uh, that Marx only hints at uh, are also uh, uh, taking place uh, as we speak. Uh, the first mechanism is uh, uh, one which certainly benefits the owners of the public debt, the creditors. Uh, for instance, Michel Isson, French Marxist uh, economist, argues that in France, uh, budget deficits have been created because the taxes for the wealthiest part of the population have been systematically lowered, and uh, of course uh, these diminishing tax revenues have to be have to be compensated somehow, and this was done by higher borrowing. Uh, now the paradox is, of course, that the people who are uh, borrowing, who are lending money to the state or buying their, their sovereign bonds, are uh, usually the ones uh, with uh, higher income and, and assets. So they they are the ones that benefit twice. First they uh, pay less taxes, and then they get the more interest on, on, on the, the state bonds. Um, the, 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 the example for the, for the second type of, of primitive accumulation to that would be a country like Greece, because here you have uh, expropriation in the strict sense of the term. Uh, we know that some of the debt uh, will be written off, and some of the investors will lose some of their money, uh, but the creditors will be able to impose privatization, which is a sort of expropriation, if you want, of the debt or of the, of the, of the Greek people. Uh, but this is still not the main point which I wanted to, 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 to get at in this lecture. Uh, uh, this is why, um, in principle, I wanted to, to propose a thesis or a hypothesis that uh, 
um, the public debt actually becomes a mechanism of primitive accumulation only in specific circumstances. So not every form of public debt should be uh, analyzed as primitive accumulation. And uh, Jan Toporowski here made a very clever observation uh, that Marx's analysis of interest bearing capital was made in a system where there was no pure credit money and there were no markets for long-term debt. So uh, that meant that the scale of funds which were available to capitalists for investments uh, was very closely determined uh, with the amount of profits. Now, when the markets of long-term debt and pure credit money were created, this link has obviously loosened. Now, to simplify a lot, I would say that in the old system, the credit had to be repaid with profits quite frequently, uh, rather than just roll over by taking on another credit in principle indefinitely, as you can do in the new system. Now, to put this parallel um, a bit further, I think that the same goes with the public debt. Because in a system which, where you have a golden standard and uh, no market for long-term debt, the state could not run uh, uh, huge budget deficits for long. It had to repay its debts with, with tax revenues or, or, or go bankrupt. Now, in the new system, there are various mechanisms which enable the state to roll over its debt without actually repaying it uh, out of taxes. For instance, it can rely on its central bank to, to, uh, to act as a lender of the last resort uh, that creates money, literally, in order to buy government uh, sovereign bonds. Now, of course, we are dealing with a, a very simplified illustration of two ideal types, I would say. Uh, but it is quite clear, I think, that they, there is a point, uh, uh, there, there, there is a substantial uh, uh, evidence that those uh, ideal types actually pertain to reality. For instance, like if you have countries, strong countries like USA or, or Japan, they can go on augmenting their deficits and debt without any problems uh, of uh, refinancing them. So I think it is, uh, uh, we can uh, use these two ideal types to, to formulate certain hypotheses. And I, I will I'll only make two, so I won't be too long. But the first one would be that uh, only this first type of public debt, the one which was known to Marx, the one I, I described as a pre-modern, is a case of primitive accumulation. Because only in such a system, uh, the debt has to be repaid directly with taxes. So this means that the money of the working people is extracted by means of taxes in order to pay the interest to private investors who, through this mechanism, turn their idle money into interest-bearing capital. And when something goes wrong, like in Greece, the creditors can pressure the state to cut its spending, to raise its taxes, or even to sell its assets, so we have expropriation. Now, the second and the last hypothesis is that uh, the debt crisis in the EU, EU, EU periphery is becoming a case of primitive accumulation because uh, the public debt is starting to function in this pre-modern way which I have just uh, described. You have countries like Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Slovenia, you name it, that issue their debt in a currency that they don't control. So there is no buyer, in principle, in the last resort, and they are having serious trouble re refinancing the debt in financial markets. So what they do is they are cutting their expenses and their deficit by austerity measures because investors seem to think that the debt might never, might not be uh, rolled over and could only be repaid with taxes. So there is one last crucial question that has to be asked. Uh, why is it that some countries, like Slovakia, that are quite in the same position, also Eurozone member states, do not face those same problems? Now, my answer would be that uh, the crucial difference between uh, countries like Spain, Italy, Slovenia, and so on, on the one hand, and Slovakia, and maybe some others on the other, is that Slovakia has adjusted its economy to this pre-modern type of financing long before the crisis ever happened. So the paradox is that uh, Slovakia and certain countries like Slovakia have access to normal, modern financing precisely because its economic and social structures are constrained or are curtailed by the simple pre-modern imperative of Angela Merkel who says, okay, you cannot spend more than you produce. And uh, to conclude, I, I think that this is the same logic which is behind the latest ECB uh, rescue programs. Uh, ECB is uh, European Central Bank. Uh, they say, okay, 
we will act as a lender of the last resort, we will buy your uh, sovereign bond, but only if you start acting as if there were no lender in the last resort, as if you are living in this pre-modern uh, uh, credit system. Um, okay, so I started with some empirical uh, data and ended with a couple of shaky hypotheses, but uh, maybe sometimes it's helpful to, to start with shaky hypotheses in order to arrive at uh, sound conclusions. Thank you. Marco, uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jan Toporowski. Uh, his uh, talk is entitled uh, Interest Bearing Capital and uh, Accumulation of Capital. So, uh, okay, um, thank you very much uh, for, for this introduction. Um, I, I wanted to just start off by thanking my friends in Ljubljana for, uh, for their kindness in inviting me uh, to this your beautiful city. Uh, to talk about, I think, these crucial uh, issues in how one uh, interprets Marx and how one, um, uh, uh, and in particular, how, how to use the, the analysis of Marx to, to illuminate our understanding of the present crisis. Um, and actually, before I start, I also want to reassure uh, those friends that uh, uh, Kalinsky is actually on his way and the first volume was completed in January and will be in the bookshops uh, in the summer. Uh, the, uh, let me start off with a story that illustrates some of the points that I'm, uh, that I'm going to make. It's a story that comes from uh, the biography of, or the autobiography of a uh, Hungarian uh, uh, journalist, George Mikesh. And he told this rather, uh, he was, uh, he's known in England as a, as a writer of humorous books, uh, satirizing the English. Uh, in particular, his, uh, uh, his most famous book is How to Be an Alien, which shows how uh, it, it pokes fun at the English. But in, in his, uh, uh, he has another book which is called How to Be Poor, where he tells uh, a true story, that, the true story of how around 1931 or 1932, when he was a, a journalist in Budapest, uh, he was uh, invited with his editor, his editor invited him to go uh, along with him to have lunch with uh, a, a very, very well-known banker who had been, who uh, was the, the, the most important banker in Hungary in the 1920s, uh, and then uh, was ruined in the, uh, after the 1929 crash. So Mikesh was expecting to, uh, to go and meet this man in a, uh, in a rather humble place somewhere in the suburbs of uh, Budapest. And instead they went to a, a very, uh, uh, to, to the uh, uh, most uh, wealthiest street in, in, in Budapest, Andrashut, at the time, and to the biggest house there where a chauffeur was polishing a very expensive car. They knocked on the door, they showed their card, uh, they, were, they, were, they were invited in, the conversation was very nice, the food was, friend, were, were, was were extremely nice with French wines and with servants around the place. So afterwards, as they were leaving, uh, Mikesh said to his editor, um, look, I'm, you know, I'm puzzled about all this. I thought you said this was, uh, you know, this particular banker who we ruined this. And uh, the, 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 the editor says, yes, it's right. it's right. It's that man. And so Mikesh said, well, I thought he was ruined. And the, the, uh, the editor said, that's right, I mean, he's, he's totally, totally wiped out. Uh, so Mikesh thought for one and said, but he's living on the most, uh, the biggest house on the most expensive street in, uh, in Budapest. And the, the editor said, you know, looked at him a bit patiently as if he didn't understand this. He said, look, you know, you don't understand. He owes so much money on this house that he can't leave it and the bank won't take it because it won't get its money back so he stays there. 
So Mikesh thought about this for a while, and he said, yes, but all the servants that are in the house, you know, how, how does he pay them? And the, um, the, the editor said, well, you really don't understand. You know, he owes them so much money in salary that they can't leave him. <laughs> they have to stay there and work. <laughs> so finally, uh, Mikesh said to him, well, okay, now that I can you know, see with this. He, they, he said, well, um, yeah, but the, 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 the very expensive dinner with the French wines and so on. And the editor looked at him with puzzlement and he said, you don't expect him to starve, do you? <laughs> this is, and actually the, 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 sort of the, the chapter is entitled The Poor Banker. Now actually, this is still going on today. Uh, in in uh, a couple of years ago, when I was in Athens in the in the middle of the crisis, and I asked uh, uh, a couple of uh, professors at the university, or you know, how have they been affected? Of course, they had had uh, their uh, salaries cut, um, but that wasn't the point really. I, so I, I said to them, "Yes, I, I was head of department for the." Uh, the poorest people, the hourly paid people, you know, how are they, uh, what's happened to them? And uh, he said, oh, well, they're still here, but they're not being paid. So I said, well, if they haven't been paid, why are they still there? And he said, well, the idea is that if they stay there, in the first place, it's a prestigious university. In the second place, if they stay there, eventually they may get paid. So of course, this answers uh, the, the whole problem of primitive accumulation of how do you uh, how do you do primitive accumulation um, without paying your workers. Okay, uh, let me go on to the serious uh, discussion: um, uh, primitive austerity and primitive accumulation. Uh, my view, as I think has been indicated in the introduction about me and the story I've just told. My, my interpretation of Marx is, a, is actually a financial one. I, uh, I want uh, to see that the role that debt put, uh, plays in Marx, in particular uh, interest-bearing capital. Marx, I think there are two elements in, in, in Marx, uh, in Marx's theory. One is the theory of value and exploitation which uh, I think is important and a, 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 which Marx used to show the social and class foundation of value and profit. And uh, the second element, which is the theory of accumulation, which shows how that profit is monetized or realized uh, and also it shows the dynamics uh, of capitalist production. I, I see primitive accumulation as belonging to this latter part of his theory. Um, I, I think it's a, um, I, I take a, a, fi a, a financial view of uh, primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation coming from um, two uh, sources, principal sources that Marx discusses, mercantile capital, and then in, uh, in the, 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 there is, uh, and then the land market, which is, the land market becomes very, very important at a, at a particular stage uh, in, in primitive accumulation. Um, the problem for um, for capitalist production uh, and the problem which I think highlights the, the really crucial importance of primitive accumulation is that uh, whereas mercantile capitalism requires simply circulating capital, you need, you need just enough money to hire a, uh, uh, hire a boat or transport your products, you need enough money to buy products and then uh, you, uh, when you want to sold the products, uh, you, you repay, you, you repay those, uh, that finance. So uh, it, this is 
different from um, uh, capitalist production, where you actually need very large, much larger amounts of financing for um, the, the, for the initial capital outlay for uh, for equipment, um, also uh, materials and wages. And this gives rise to uh, the, uh, 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 what I think is quite interesting, is the whole process of financial innovation. Uh, the, the, the first one being postponed payments. And he, he, this, is, uh, uh, this is discussed uh, by Mark Hughes here, which is the rules of exchange uh, uh, using uh, a payment of uh, piecework. Uh, payment of workers after their um, work, as long as possible after their uh, uh, work has been done. And then eventually the, the process of financial uh, innovation coming to its culmination in the 1870s with uh, various uh, companies acts which make the, the joint stock company standard form for uh, the, the capitalist production so you can concentrate uh, finance and, uh, and, and facilitate uh, this kind of large scale financing of, of, of capital. Before that, you know, very, very the, the significant uh, capitalist enterprises, the railways, the canals, and so on, being, you know, having to have very special uh, legislative, um, uh, uh, special laws passed to allow um, uh, uh, the, the joint stock form of uh, company organization or fin uh, uh, company financing. After that, it becomes much, much more routine. Uh, and it, you know, this actually changes the operation of interest-bearing capital. The sad point is that, of course, Marx uh, didn't get around to analysing um, uh, this uh, this new financial form, the stock market financing, uh, where uh, it, it, it's then let the Hilferding uh, analyses it in, in finance capital in a, in a way which I think is, uh, uh, is very important but still not entirely satisfactory. Uh, for that matter, the, the, the same may be, may be said of uh, 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 Marx because it's not uh, Marx always, I think we have to remember in reading Marx and Marx is a, an unfinished word, Marx. This is always a work in progress. And then I think the next stage, I mean, uh, the, the, the next stage uh, in, uh, is the, in, in the development of, of finance is uh, the role of the state, and in particular, uh, I think the work of Gershenkron uh, and uh, Kindleberger, in which uh, the state uh, who emphasised the role of the state in organising uh, finance for uh, primitive accumulation in countries that are uh, that are um, uh, where where capitalist uh, development is at a relatively early stage. In the more advanced capitalist countries, you will have uh, primitive accumulation being reduced by this. Uh, by the new markets in long-term debt capital, uh, these uh, uh, um, uh, primitive accumulation is really reduced to a problem for uh, uh, of petty capitalists. Uh, the the uh, large corporations do not have to engage in, in problems of uh, do not have to engage in primitive accumulation because they have access to the whole range of long-term debt markets. 
And it's in this context that I think we have to see austerity. Because uh, austerity is predicated on uh, the idea that uh, the government can run at the surplus with which to uh, uh, repay its debt. And this kind of uh, operation, uh, unless it's done in, in, a, in a very, very uh, uh, careful way, which I will indicate later on, is uh, actually the effect of it is to drain the internal liquidity of capitalist firms. Why? Because in, if in the pro what happens in the process of production and exchange is that capitalists throw money into circulation and uh, then uh, receive it back uh, as they hope with a profit. The profit coming, as Marx said, uh, not from the expenditure of the workers, but from the expenditure of the capitalists themselves on their own consumption and on capital accumulation. Uh, if, you, if, the, if the government, in the process of that circuit, takes, um, uh, removes uh, some of that money that's, that has been circulated and transfers it to rentiers, which it would do if it repays its uh, debt, then uh, you, and the rest it, it is thrown, into, thrown back into circulation, then effectively uh, the, uh, the functioning capitalists are left with uh, less money than they have thrown into circulation. So they're in, uh, operating with a financial loss. Uh, what, uh, because of the, this uh, austerity, this drive to try and generate uh, a surplus, in the state accounts. The uh, firms have responded with uh, what Keynes uh, would have called a high liquidity preference, effectively transforming interest-bearing capital into idle capital. And it seems to me that there are two ways in which you can overcome this, two methods for overcome. Uh, within the capitalist uh, framework. First of all, uh, you, you can redistribute wages, uh, the higher wages, to uh, effectively drain some of that idle capital and put it back into active circulation. Uh, by the way, I should, have, uh, I should have said at the beginning, uh, fiscal austerity doesn't affect large corporations very much. As you, you can see this, if you look at the balance sheets of large corporations, they are now, uh, they're accumulating uh, liquidity, they're not, but they're not spending money. Uh, what it affects most of all are the petty capitalists. It affects their primitive accumulation. And it, and it makes it impossible for them to accumulate capital. So if you recycle idle capital through higher wages, uh, you can, uh, you can, you, you are actually assisting uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. The other way in which this can be done uh, is through uh, capital taxation. If uh, governments uh, tax uh, the capital, uh, in other words, the balance sheets of firms, this is, and uh, then use this money either to, uh, uh, for their own expenditure or to repay their debts. Uh, this is, this transforms idle capital uh, back into interest-bearing capital. And you know, this is why I, I think that one, uh, 
the, one should reject the simplistic Keynesian notion that only by having a fiscal deficit can uh, capital, capitalists accumulate uh, money. There are actually other ways in which uh, capitalists uh, can accumulate money. And the principal one uh, in particular is uh, through their own uh, investment because this is the way in which investment is the, is the or what one might call the natural way in which capitalists can transform interest bearing capital uh, into, sorry, idle capital into uh, uh, interest bearing capital. And I think this is the way, uh, it, so it's these two ways, higher wages and capital taxation, that it is possible to transform uh, uh, is the, the, the juncture. I think that uh, in, in, you know, this is a, a temporary uh, phenomenon. You can, uh, it's possible to turn around um, the, the, the present depression uh, and turn around the business cycle through through these measures. But I think I think it's uh, in, in the long run there is only one solution, and that is socialism.
of a, a national investment board, as he understood that in a rentier economy that is in a less fair uh, capitalism, there is no appropriate mechanism that could actually regulate the flow of aggregate investment <coughs> because the system displays uh, uh, elements of myopia. It's short-sighted and as it is driven by, by short-term profits. Uh, so the basic claim against uh, um, uh, against uh, uh, neoclassical austerity hawks uh, revolves around the argument that spending in an economy with an unused productive capacity uh, will not crowd out private output, private investment. Uh, in fact, the fiscal stimulus will bring about uh, more, uh, more production and more employment and that will in, true, uh, in turn uh, uh, via multiplier effect uh, bring more demand and even more production. So the deficit uh, should not be a problem since it will be covered by an increase in tax revenue and more savings and uh, which will of course take also uh, care of the um, upward pressure uh, on the rate of interest. So the question is I think is this a recipe for Eastern Europe? Uh, is this a recipe for um, European periphery outside of the Eurozone? Uh, I think that um, the answer is no, because uh, not only because of the effectiveness, but uh, because the very possibility of fiscal uh, stimulus is predicated upon the economic context. Uh, the argument put forward by Keynesian, Keynesians uh, presupposes that we are dealing uh, with a, a government that borrows in its own sovereign currency. Uh, now this is clearly not true uh, in the case of Eastern European periphery. Um, although these countries are not part of the monetary union, um, they do uh, uh, all their borrowing in a foreign currency and there is an imperative throughout these countries uh, to maintain a fixed uh, exchange rate. Uh, this, is their, this is the common feature of the, of the periphery outside of the, uh, of the Eurozone in the European East. Uh, the same thing, I think, could be said about recent proposals by some post Keynesians uh, that concerns itself with uh, developing an, dom a, a domestic uh, uh, demand-led growth. Um, the, um, uh, the, the elements of this, proposer, uh, of this proposal are, of course, um, truly important for the left um, uh, in peripheral countries also. Uh, but at the same time they go against uh, the very institutional and political setting or design which arose during the so-called transition period. In that sense, uh, from the perspective of the peripheral countries, the uh, unilateral application of the Keynesian cure, uh, I think it is inherently <coughs> dangerous. I think we can admit, admit that much. Uh, at the same time, the notion of going beyond Keynesianism without taking to account the complexities of peripheral situation is, I think, as incoherent as a Deweyan or Zizekian communist hypothesis. Uh, now, uh, in the rest of this talk, I will try to shed some light on the difficulties and deadlocks uh, of, the peripheral, uh, of the peripheral position by examining the notion of fiscal capacity and the process of financialization of the government bond market. Uh, investigation of the notion of fiscal capacity is uh, connected, I think, in a straightforward manner um, uh, to the issue of accumulation by dispossession and also fiscal sustainability. Uh, now, to cut the long story short, uh, there is no proper technical analysis uh, which could be used uh, to, um, to determine the solvency of, of a particular country. Solvency depends on the ability perform debt service in the long run, so the usual indicators such as public debt or uh, primary fiscal balance are not enough. In the last in instance, it is a political question, in as much as the assets which could be used or sold in order to improve um, the fiscal capacity of a country uh, depend on the power, on the power relations uh, between the government and employers on the one hand and various usually leftist organizations on the other. So uh, if, the, if, the democratic mechanism, uh, uh, if the democratic mechanisms are strong, it will uh, be that much harder to start the process of the accumulation by a dispossession. Um, so in peripheral countries of Eastern Europe, given their common features, 
deindustrialization, uh, macroeconomic constraints established by the Maastricht agenda, uh, high degree of euroization, both loan and deposit euroization, and the corresponding imperative to keep the exchange rate fixed. Uh, we, uh, we have seen an effort by the ruling classes to establish accumulation by its dispossession uh, as a legitimate policy tool. Uh, this appears to be, from their point of view, a more plausible response to the sudden stops in cross-border capital inflows. Uh, in the period before crisis, roughly from 2000 to 2007, uh, the export-led growth model um, uh, inevitably mutated um, uh, into consumption-led uh, growth model underpinned by credit expansion, that is, this massive capital inflows. Uh, and it's, this is, of course, uh, courtesy of relatively uh, uh, rapid financial liberalization, uh, both internal and external. Uh, it is important to notice that the institutions uh, of Keynesian compromise in the peripheral countries of Eastern Europe have not been built. Uh, in other words, these economies, if we use the varieties of capitalism discourse, appear more as liberal market economies and less as coordinated market economies, even though in reality they are neither and should be classified as a dependent market economies. In any case, this particular combination uh, of uh, financial liberalization, high degree of euroization together with a deficiency in terms of, um, of, the, of the institutions of, of uh, Keynesian compromise make the Keynesian solution to the crisis in this region uh, an improbable political goal. Uh, okay, so the other question that needs to be addressed in the context of the analysis of, uh, uh, of fiscal crisis of peripheral states is the financialization of the government bond market. Uh, here we are dealing with uh, the familiar question of the relationship between private capital markets and uh, government policy choices. Uh, the literature on this issue is quite large, but in general it suggests uh, that capital market openness allows investors uh, to react swiftly uh, and severely to changes in government policy outcomes. It also finds that, uh, uh, that investors' consideration uh, varies across, across countries. Uh, so in the case of, of advanced uh, capitalist countries, uh, capital market participants consider only a narrow set of, of government policies, that is, key macroeconomic indi indicators, uh, but they leave out the, the so-called supply side uh, policies. Uh, and so the result, the end result of this is the, the strong but narrow, uh, as a line of most put it, uh, strong but, but narrow uh, financial market constraint. However, when it comes to uh, the developing countries uh, or the peripheral countries, the investors are not so confident that the governments will service their debt in an orderly fashion. And so the question of default becomes important. And that in turn, uh, in turn mean, means that both uh, micro and macro policies will be uh, examined, will come under, uh, under scrutiny. Uh, the fact that European governments in monetary uh, union borrow in a foreign currency and that they cannot monetize their debts is also uh, relevant when one looks at, uh, at, the, periphery, uh, at the periphery outside uh, of the monetary union. Uh, for their ability to conduct an autonomous economic policy and by extension decent social policy is confined in, I, I would say, in much, uh, much, in much of the same way. Uh, in fact, the situation is somewhat worse as the currency mismatch puts more pressure not only on government but also on uh, non-financial uh, firms and especially on low and middle income uh, households, that is, on the working class. Uh, so if it, if, it, if it is true that uh, the sovereign bond market uh, constraints uh, of the government, that is, the fear of the negative reaction, the reaction of the financial uh, government uh, can uh, uh, deter governments from pursuit, pr from pursuit of certain policies, uh, the financialization has brought only an additional, uh, only an additional uh, pressure. Uh, Ian Hardy's research uh, on, on the government ability to borrow has shown that there is a trade-off between investors' loyalty 
and the degree of financialization. So in short, uh, the financialization of the market uh, corresponds to the ability uh, of the investor uh, to uh, create uh, more liquidity and to trade risk. So if the structure uh, of the market is such that it stimulates short-term operations uh, with high yields, and if it, if it allows a low exposure and a quick exit in times of crisis, it is highly probable that uh, the investor's loyalty uh, will erode. And this means, as Hardy observes, uh, the increased financialization uh, of uh, financial market actors and government bond market structure can undermine debt sustainability and increase debt intolerance by increasing borrowing costs and the likelihood and severity of the debt crisis. Now, a more comprehensive uh, elaboration of this topic would have, uh, would have to take into account uh, how the transformation of tra traditional banking, what is known as traditional banking in Europe, further boosted impatient finance in the sovereign uh, bond market. And of course, as recent post-Keynesian literature shows, financialization has allowed uh, banks to rely uh, less on traditional funding through deposit activity and to turn to market funding instead. So, in order to, 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 wrap, uh, to wrap up uh, 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 and to come to my final point or conclusion, uh, I think that the problem uh, uh, of the restoration of capitalism through a particular form of uh, primitive accumulation has, over the years, produced a debt-driven model of development. Uh, of course, the orthodox discourse claimed that there would be some sort of spillover effects of the foreign direct investments and that the host country would benefit from uh, arranging uh, from bridging in such, such as technology transfer or uh, know-how and competition, and also that there would, there would be a substantial growth uh, in human capital. But what in fact happened uh, was that a large portion of foreign capital entered Eastern Europe, uh, either in the form of portfolio investment or with the, with the intention of taking, uh, of taking hold uh, developed and profitable sectors, um, such as of course, the banking sector or the, or the telecommunications. So, uh, uh, so the process of the segregation of, um, of the core and periphery has uh, an inherent tendency to convert the strategy of, of the export-led growth, which Keynesians uh, rightly criticize, into consumption-led growth. And in the end, we have a small, uh, we have a group of small and fragile economies uh, dependent. Uh, uh, and uh, in, a, in a way, uh, which, which in a way have very uh, limited influence in the course of the crisis. And I think this is a point that um, the left uh, in this region must take into account. There are, I think, great dan dangers involved in mechanically importing, in importing the solutions or strategies uh, of, uh, developed in the advanced capitalist countries by the left. Uh, so, it, in, other word, in other words, it would be uh, difficult to go beyond Keynesianism if we are not able to pursue these policies in the first place. Uh, so, I think that we can uh, kind of put forward some minimal, uh, minimal requests that uh, the, left sh uh, the left should answer to, um, uh, given the complexity of the economic situation in Eastern Europe. I think that, um, first of all, the program of theorization is absolutely necessary for not only for the possible creation of, of, a, uh, of a situation that in which countries can deal with their own sovereign currency, but also because um, um, the uh, theorization or de-dollarization involves uh, the destruction of this uh, potentially very dangerous effect of uh, currency mismatch. Also, uh, the other thing that I would uh, put forward uh, as a proposal is um, introduction of the labor uh, legislation that would enable um, a democratic firm to act as a reasonable alternative to a traditional capitalist enterprise. So, uh, this is important in the, in the sense that uh, uh, without uh, democratization of the economic sphere, uh, what we are uh, what we are left with is, is basically supporting the industrialization of or reindustrialization 
strategy and that by extension means supporting the local or the national bourgeoisie, which of course is not uh, uh, is not a goal that the left should, uh, should appropriate. Uh, so my point here is that we should not, of course, bash Keynesians. Uh, in fact, I think there is a lot to, to learn uh, from the post-Keynesian analysis, but uh, we should respect the, uh, the, um, the situation, the complex situation uh, created over the years in Eastern Europe and make an effort to create uh, a Marxian framework for understanding uh, uh, how, uh, how periphery functions.
situations. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, if there is no question or comments, I will uh, conclude. Uh, I'd just like to... Uh, 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 okay. <laughs> you have to ask a very profound question. <laughs> yes, thank you. I don't think I'll come up with a very profound question. <laughs> but, uh, Maybe I'll show a comment. Show a comment. <laughs> Okay, so we'll wrap it up then. Uh, I'd just like to invite you on our uh, next uh, panel discussion that will take place uh, here at uh, 1 o'clock. Uh, uh, this will be a panel uh, on a socialist uh, alternative. <laughs>